I have been looking forward to this. I'm going to I'm going to start with a with a transition or a segue from what someone said in in a, uh, a panel discussion. She referred to Daniel Kahneman. Who's heard of Daniel Kahneman out there? Raise your hand if you've heard of Daniel Kahneman. I'm seeing a two hands <laughs> from my wife. Daniel Kahneman, for, for marketers, we should really understand who this guy is. He is a psychologist, okay, a psychologist who has won the Nobel Prize in economics. Never been done before, hasn't happened since. So something revolutionary is, he talked about something revolutionary. One of the things he talked about is this mysterious creature called Homo economicus. Everyone here of Homo economicus? Perhaps in your economics class or a business class, maybe even your marketing class. Which you see with this Homo economicus person, this is someone who makes decisions all on ration, rational decisions, logic, facts. What Kahneman told us is this person doesn't exist never has existed. If you are human, if your bosses are human, if your clients are human, if your customers are humans, we make decisions on emotion and justify rationally. We had a wonderful panel discussion up here that the first day there was a woman, a hair, um, a skincare woman, Danielle, I think. She talked about this new product that had all these great ingredients in it, and it just, it just rocketed. It did great for them. Remember that conversation? Well, why did people buy that product? Was it because of the ingredients? Or was it because it made the skin better? Or perhaps it was because the users felt perhaps beautiful and confident and felt good about themselves. That's a real powerful emotional benefit. I was watching an ad not too long ago of a, of a kid, he walks in home and, and the mom conjoles him to eat some healthy snack and on the way out, he turns to his mom and says, thanks mom, you're the best. So the power of having someone you value more than life itself tell you you're the best. One of the biggest predictors of, of malpractice suits is poor bedside manner. Okay, you don't get sued over poor bedside manner, but if something goes wrong, the likelihood you're gonna get sued is a lot more. Again, emotion. Now, we've had a wonderful, I've loved these conversations. I love the data conversations, I love the AI conversations, I love the digging into Instagram to see what people are saying, but that's not where we're gonna find those deep-seated emotional benefits. They're not gonna show up there. Sometimes we still have to talk to our customers and ask questions and understand why. Another panelist, uh, I think yesterday, had a recommendation. They said, we've gotta ask why. I'm gonna build on that. Ask why, then ask why, then ask why, then ask why, then ask why. So why do you like that, that cosmetic? Well, the ingredients. Why do you like the ingredients? Well, it makes my skin healthy. Well, why do you like that? Well, it, it makes me look better. Well, why do you like that? Well, I feel beautiful. Why do you like that? Because I'm confident in myself, right? That's where the power is. That's what Kahneman is talking about. How do we find that out? Look, with the billions of dollars we spend managing and advertising brands, shouldn't we know that? If, if, if your companies are spending millions of dollars. If you're an agency serving clients that are spending millions of dollars, shouldn't we know those things? What does your brand stand for, right? What are those drivers of choice, those real drivers of choice, and how does your brand stand up against those drivers of choice? What are the barriers to buy your brand, those emotional barriers? Aren't those the things we need to figure out? Well, that's what we try to get to in a good brand study. I'm gonna review, um, an approach to brand tracking. Next slide. Next slide. Yep, I'm there. they're perfect. And I, I promise you, by the end of this, I, you all will know more about how to create a better brand tracker than 95% of the research firms out there, okay? And, and the, the challenge is the way we do brand tracking hasn't changed in decades. 
decades. Even when I was a junior analyst at Hallmark Cards 30 years ago, we, 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 we tracked grants the same way we did then. Okay, we went from mall intercept, then we went to telephone, now we're online, but the structure of the studies, the, the questions we ask, they're all the same. But as, as we learn from Kennelman, we've learned so much about how humans make choices. Again, the, these, these revolutions to how humans make decisions are so revolutionary, not just Kahneman, but the other Nobel Prize winners. We should be paying attention to this, right? But the challenge is, how we evaluate brands today has not changed in decades, and how we do it is not consistent at all with how humans make these real world decisions. So I'm gonna give you an alternative approach, and again, you can go and take this, it's really not that hard. But let's start with how they're done today. With traditional methods, we get respondents in a survey and we ask them to evaluate our brand and all these different attributes, right? Here I have 15 different attributes. And since you have to compare your brand to something else, you may come back and say, okay, now do the same thing against another brand. And since you need to, one benchmark isn't enough, so you may have to do it again. Okay, who has only two competitors? You, you, you get the idea. Who likes doing this kind of questionnaire? Anybody really look forward to doing this? I, I was describing this to someone I know. And quote, this, this is a quote, which, and I had to do a little video on this. She, she actually said, oh, I, I hate those scales. I hate those scales. I'm sweating, I'm tired, I just want to be done. I just want my five dollars, right? This is the kind of person that's evaluating your brand. This is the kind of person that your brand, the, the person that creates the data that your companies use to create brand strategies, multi-billion dollar brand strategies, right? Are you comfortable with that? Look, one of the biggest scales we use in, in all of these surveys is something called the Likert scale. Rhinus Likert invented the Likert scale 88 years ago. 88 years ago. This isn't your father's scale, this is your grandfather's scale, right? But we still use it today. Again, with all of this learning that we've had from Kahneman and these Nobel Prize winning guys, you can't tell me that there's not a better way. But there is. But I, I'm gonna harp on these scales for a bit more. Question, does Buffalo Wild Wings have high prices? No. Good. Hold that thought. You're ahead of me. A lot of I've asked hundreds of people this question. One of the common answers I hear is, well, compared to what? Right? I don't know if any of you had that thought when I asked that question, compared to what? So in, in the old way of, of the, way, the current way most people do brand tracking, they evaluate your brand in isolation on all these scales, not compared to anything. And, 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 and that's a problem. Look, uh, Daniel Ariely, one of the big names of behavioral economics, has said that humans rarely choose things in absolute terms. But, you know, we just had the, the respondent evaluate us in absolute terms. Now, he said, instead, we don't, we don't have this internal value meter that tells us how much things are worth. We don't have a 3.2 for this product and, and a 4.3 over here, so go over here. Now, what he said, we, we rather we focus on the relative advantage of one thing over the other. And this right here has a real, real implications. I'm going to tell you a story. I used to be the director of worldwide market research at uh, um, H&R Block. Early on there, we did a brand study, and one of the questions we asked is, are you an expert in, in, in taxes? And it's a tax company, so yeah, we got high scores. Then we came over here and we asked about, about uh, CPAs. Are CPAs ex uh, experts in taxes? Well, yeah, them too. Well, our scores really weren't very different. Fast forward to the end of the season, we learned that over 800,000 clients left us to accountants. You ask why? Well, they're the experts. Yeah, but wait a second, you guys told us that you get, we're the same on these scales. But you can't tell me that if you put HR Block and accountant side by side and say which is the expert, you know who's going to win every day of the week, right? Well, that led to the wrong decision. We decided not to talk about our expertise because we thought we had it. Instead, we started talking about other things in the, in the communications. Wrong decision for us. Another common answer I get when I ask, does Buffalo Wild Wings have high prices? It's, I don't know, I've never been there. Anybody think that? Anybody think that when I ask you, does the Buffalo Wild Wings have high prices? Okay. 
So what do you do? So, okay, if, if you look, we think about our brands much more than customers do. When we have them evaluate our brand on, on 20 different attributes, what's the likelihood the customer's going to know the answer to all 20 attributes? But then we come back again and we ask them to do it again on another brand for another 20 attributes. Then we come back and do it again for another brand. What's the likelihood they're going to know the answer on all of that? Right? But they have to answer. You, know, guys, you guys know how the surveys work, right? You've got to fill in that, that little bubble or it won't let you go on to the next question. You've got to put something there. So what do they do? Well, on a five-point scale, they probably give you a three. But here's the problem. A three is fundamentally different from a I don't know, right? It's not the same thing. And what happens when you get that? You just get bad data. Remember, we're trusting our billions of dollars of, of marketing and communications in a brand to this kind of data. OK, back to Buffalo Wild Wings. Does, does Buffalo Wild Wings have high prices? What about to, I'll make it easier, compared to Taco Bell? Does Buffalo Wild, have, Wild Wings have high prices compared to Taco Bell? Who thinks they have high prices compared to Taco Bell? Perfect, a lot of hands going up. That's what I would say. Now. Does, what about compared to Bonefish Grill or your favorite date night restaurant? Who would think they have high prices compared to that? What, no one? No one? You can't change your mind. Come on, you guys. On a survey, you can't change your mind, right? You got to put down an answer. But you change your mind. You guys are horrible respondents. But look, the, the, the point here is context matters. Right? If, if you evaluate h &R, if you evaluate Buffalo Wild Wings, and maybe in your mind you're comparing it to, to uh, uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken, it's another chicken place. Maybe somebody else is comparing it to Applebee's because it's next to Applebee's. The context, then what do those scales even mean? What's the context? So evaluations need to be in context, and not just in context, but the same context across all the respondents. That makes sense? OK, cultural differences. We know that different cultures respond differently to questionnaires. We know Latinos, for example, give us much higher scores on the same scale. So in this multicultural world, how do you compare one cultural group to another? How do you compare one country to another? I mean, sometimes we've got the same study ex executed here and then over, exit over, execute over here, perhaps with a different cultural makeup. How do we make those comparisons? Well, I, I called up a friend once. I actually had dinner with a friend. He works in research in one of the big international CPG firms that we've all heard of. I said, how do you guys do this? He said, well, we don't do anything. We just sort of ignore it. That's the best practice today because there really isn't any way to, to account for it. But again, that's how we're managing our brands. OK, the biggest, the biggest, the biggest problem of all. I'm saving for last. This is going to blow your minds. Humans don't make decisions on a five-point scale. OK, perhaps I oversold it a little bit. But, and, and I feel a little odd even putting up, up this up here as this is a big deal, but we all know it, right? We all know it, but when it comes to our research and our skills, we pretend that it's not true. I have an idea. Let's, let's evaluate brands the same way humans make choices, and it's a whole lot easier. This is the way consumers make decisions. One of the, one of the theories to describe it is scaffold theory, where you have scaffolding, and then just thinking there's another layer on top of that, another layer on top of that. Let's say you go home after this conference, and you're with your significant other, and she'll be eat in or eat out. And you say, you know, I just heard this fantastic presentation from this research guy, believe it or not, and I just want to talk to you about it, so, so let's eat out, OK? OK, where do you want to go? Well, I don't want to go to any fast food, but I blew all my money on the table, so let's go someplace in between. OK, well, where do you want to go from there? Applebee's, maybe? Well, I know the game's on tonight. Let's, let's go Buffalo Wild Wings. Isn't that how we make decisions? We, 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 we chunk topics up, we, we chunk topics up and we make choices. Nowhere in there is there any kind of scale. That's how we make decisions. So why are we still using these scales? Again, just think of if, if you're a marketer and you want to evaluate your program and you need to do it through this kind of avenue, is this the kind of data you're going to trust? 
But this is how we do it all day long, right now. I'm going to show you a whole different approach. And it's an approach that's simply, you know, one of my favorite quotes is John Maynard Keynes. He once said that the problem is not accepting new ideas, it's letting go of the old ideas. We just need to get away from these scales. I, when I showed this to a good friend who's in research, he said, yeah, but I just like my scales. I, 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 I'm comfortable with them. I know what I get. I know what to expect for a top two box. I'm comfortable with them. But we need to break away from that because that's not how humans make choices. This next slide is going to tell you exactly how it's set up. And you're going to see how easy this is, how any of you guys can do it. I'm going to use universities as an example. Notice what we're doing here is we're putting the competitive set together. And then we're going to ask, in this case, which university has the best reputation? And they're going to make a choice, just like they do in the real world. And, and, and notice here that they selected the University of Oregon as the best reputation. I, we, that's something we should all agree on, right? But they make choices. It's that simple. Now, after doing this, we have an I don't know. I, this I don't know is really important. We're not going to force someone to make a choice if they don't know. I'm going to show you something really cool about that I don't know in a bit. But when we learn, after doing this a few times, we realize, oh, wait, you know the coolest thing at all about this? Well, it would have been seven questions. It's now just one. Just think of the old way. OK, uh, evaluate University of Oregon on reputation. OK, now evaluate University of Kansas on reputation. Now evaluate Oregon State on reputation. OK, now I value Drake on your reputation. OK, now I value Stan. I'm, that's what we're doing, right? But we can get all that data with this one question. Even if they don't select the brand, in the data set, there's a big, fat zero. And that zero has meaning. And we use that in the analysis. So if you have 10 questions, that would take 70 questions the old way, or the current way, how most people are still doing it. But it would just take 10 questions your way. See how easy this is for respondents? How much more fun it is for respondents? How we get more data, more benchmarks from all these different brands? Now, when we do this, I wanted to share this. The, the kinds of metrics we ask, coming back to Kenneman. So we'll always ask uh, uh, an outcome variable, like I would choose this brand. This is my favorite brand. I would go there. I would go to this school. We're also going to ask those functional benefits because that's a lot of what our clients want us to ask is, what's the price? Is it a good value? What are the ingredients? All these functional benefits. But we also definitely want to get to the emotional benefits because when we do all of our modeling, this is where the decisions really lie. And since brand personality matters, we ask about brand personality. So look at these kinds of metrics. All of these universities with all these different kinds of metrics, you're going to have a wonderful, great, rich understanding of all of these universities and the brands and which, which one's strong, which one's weak on all kinds of dimensions. OK, who here goes home after work, fires up their PC so they can take questionnaires and surveys? Anyone? Huh? No? Who are these people? Right? OK, 20 years ago, there, was, there probably were a lot of people because it was, everything was newer and online surveys, and they would do that. That doesn't happen anymore. But sometimes us in market research, we pretend it does happen. So what happens? This happens. You know, I, I was moderating some focus groups with some traders not too long ago. And these weren't just traders. These guys were trading futures. They were trading options on futures. And there were a couple young guys in the room that held up their phone and said, I'm going to do it all on this thing. They're trading options on futures with their phone. Not too long ago, I was in the, uh, the interior of the Dominican Republic. There wasn't running water. There wasn't pavement. But there were smartphones. You know, th this is how the, this, we all have these smartphones, right? So. There, there's programs like Qualtrics where you can do the program and it'll render it on, on, a, on a mobile device, but it's different to design it for the mobile device. That's very different. Now, the reason I'm showing you all this and mentioning this is this kind of system works great on a mobile device, right? You can do it whenever you're convenient. Let's say it's your uh, wife's turn to pick the movie and she picks the six-hour version of Prime Prejudice. 
Perfect time to do your surveys, maybe. OK, I'm going to switch gears. It, it's that simple. That's how you collect the data. It's that simple. It's not that hard. You guys can start doing it next week. But now I'm going to switch gears into how you analyze this kind of data. OK, you guys better know who this A lot of you guys better know who this guy is. Someone yell out a name. David, David, David Ogilvy, Confessions of an Advertising Man was his book. When the big names in advertising, I think he came up with the, the VW ad years ago. He came up with the Marlboro Man. He came up with, you meet the nicest people on the Honda. Well, David Ogilvy has said, consumers don't think how they feel, say what they think, or do what they say. Right? If, if they do that, how do you research them? How do you talk to them? How do you know what really matters if that's the truth? Right? That creates quite a conundrum for us, us, us researchers. So we talked about Kahneman. Kahneman is essentially confirming what David Ogilvy knew 50 years ago, that most oppressions and thoughts arise in our conscious experience. That means we think about something, we form an opinion, you think, I like this brand or I don't like that brand. We, 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 this, all of these thoughts come to our conscious experience without you even knowing how they got there. Right? The, and remember, Nobel Prize winner, OK? This is just me saying this. We don't necessarily even know how those ideas got there. Think, think of a, a, a two, the perfect example is like, like a two-year-old kid who's overtired, and you know they're just tired, they need a nap. And you ask them, and they're crying and having a fit. So what's wrong? And they'll come up with some reason, and you just know that's not the real reason. That, that's the early signs of, of how our brains are beginning to work. We're going to try to come up with a rational reason for something that's emotional. So how do you do that? Or, as we've talked about before, decisions are based on emotion justified rationally. So how do you even ask the question, why do you do that? We need to take care when we're asking the question, why do we do that? So how do we do that? So the old way, and many way, people still do this, and in, in the market research world, this has probably been out there for a decade, but just to share it with you, um, the, the old way is to ask the question, what's most important? But since consumers don't think what they feel, say what they think, or do what they say, can we even trust that? So instead, there's a model of importance. And I'm not going to go into that now, but we can derive the importance to find out what truly is the driver. We can, uh, they may not say those emotional things are, are the real reasons, but we can analytically determine if they're the real reasons. I'm not going to go into how we do that, but it's really not that hard. So that's been around a while. So we understand what really are those drivers, but I'm going to show you a way to present this data. So we like to plot these drivers of choice based on this model data against your brand's perception. And what do you get? you get your brand strengths right there, those attributes that are important, and your brand does great on them. We also get your brand weaknesses, the barriers, the things you really need to fix for more people to consider them. We've got clients who, th this is the, like, the key page of the executive summary, because this one slide tells so much what we're good at and where we need to improve. Yeah, there may be 100 other pages of in, in, in the deck, but this summarizes a really key important point. With this data, we can do the perceptual maps. And some of you have seen these. Some people like them. Some people don't. I like them. I like to see how brands are seen as similar or different from other brands. Oh, where the white space? OK, you marketing people. You keep asking us researchers, where's the white space? You know, that, that wonderful space in the consumer's mind there where there's no competitors and, and with things that are really important to them? Do we want to find that white space? Well, there's not a good way of finding that white space. There never has been until now. You know that don't know question we put in there? By plotting that don't know against these drivers of choice up there in the right-hand column, right-hand quadrant, that's your drivers of choice. I've never found a more ele analytically elegant way of answering that question. OK, I'm going to show just one more thing. We've seen this purchase funnel up on this screen over the last few days. It's important we need to know the purchase funnel. 
I'm going to show you another way of looking at it that you can do with this data, or you can even do with your scale data. If you still have your scale data on five-point scales or your research guy or you have it, you can create this kind of chart even with that data. If you plot awareness versus consideration, and when I say consideration, I mean consideration of those who are aware. This is so cool. Okay, you can identify the rising stars. Those are those firms that not very many people are aware of them, but those that are aware of them love them. That may be Starbucks 20 years ago, right? You can plot, you can identify, is your brand a, a rising star or is it a stronger brand where everyone knows who it is and everyone loves it? Or is it a weaker brand? For, or this, notice we almost have a life cycle here of a brand from, from not on the radar, perhaps rising star, strong brands, and then over time, if they become not as uh, relevant for the market anymore. So the one on the far left could be Sears, for example. They used to be over on the right, used to be where America shops, not anymore, but we all know who they are. What I love about this grid is it's, it, it, the, the, the strategies that come from it are so clear and so important. If you're a rising star, it's all about, a tr all about awareness. Look, if one of your clients is a rising star, what great data to say, hey, maybe we need to increase our marketing spend, right? If you're a strong brand, we need to continue protecting who we are, but keep an eye on, 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 keep an eye on those rising stars and protect yourself against them. If you're a weaker established brand, we need to find a way to revitalize, find a way for uh, the market to um, reconsider you. Okay. That's what I've got. So again, we spend billions of dollars on, on, our, on our media, right? On our brands, managing our brands. And we need to understand those real emotional reasons why they make choices. And sometimes you just need to talk to customers and or survey customers to find out what they are. But let's do it in a way that's consistent with how humans really make decisions, not a traditional scale, scale approach that we've been using for, for decades. And that's it. And if you have any questions, great. If not, um, have a good day. If there are any questions, feel free to uh, give me a call, and I'd be glad to talk this over with you. Thank you.